This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, wonderful people. Look at the sun rising over here in the Sabi Sands and Juma Game Reserve. We're just going to watch it for a moment because the timing is perfect. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful, lovely mist this morning. It's chilly, just a little chilly, not too bad. And I'm very excited to have you all on the safari, your live safari. How awesome is that, everyone? I've got lots of plans. Steve has got lots of plans, and so do our other locations. So I'm very excited. I hope that you are too. Let's watch this glorious sun arising over the horizon. Absolutely stunning. Well, it's your live safari, everyone, so jump on board. It's live and it's through the African bush. Good morning. What a glorious morning. I love watching the sunrise. The first thing in the morning. We are so lucky out here when we're out nice and early to catch these beautiful sunrises and the awesome sunsets that we managed to see. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hi everyone, it's me, Trishalo. Shall I say yellow because I have a new yellow cap? I'll ask your opinion about it at a later stage. I've got Khat on camera with me and we are going on a bit of an adventure with you as well. You know that because it's your live safari, everyone. So use that hashtag Wild Earth to chat to us. You can use at FC on the YouTube chat stream. You can also go to our website and use our questions and comments box. And you can, if you're under 18, use kids questions at wildearth.tv and send us an email with anything that you'd like to discuss, any question you have, whether it's silly or whether you think it's silly or not, there are no no silly questions, only silly answers. So please do chat to us. Now we're coming to you from Juma Game Reserve. It's on the western fringes of the Kruger National Park here in the Sabi Sands. And it's quite a quiet morning. I can hear some Franklins. Can you hear them? Meep, 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 meep. And I want to take this moment to just kind of listen out as I have been as we've been driving around to see if I could pick up any clues such as roars in the distance, maybe close by. Steve would love that. He wants to look for some lions this morning. There were some lions found in the north last night, so he's going to follow up on that. This morning for me, I'm looking for some elephants. That would be great. So I'm going to check out the dams to the south, but I also want to find some tracks hopefully get us a leopard for this gorgeous morning. Christopher Freak, you say the sunrise is magnificent, isn't it? I especially like them in winter. There's a softness to it. Especially with all the mist, it's extra beautiful. And I've just heard some, some Franklin's shouting a little bit uh, more aggressively than normal. So I'm going to go check that out. It's there by Gallego Pan. So we're going to swing around and have a look at what those Franklins are doing. So here it's a little bit chilly. It's about 17 degrees Celsius, 62 degrees Fahrenheit. But it's sure to warm up as the morning progresses. All right, let's get moving. Because we're right here near the pan. Oh, a little bit of a wipe because it is quite misty. Anyway, I've told you about the weather here, so let's go and have a look at what the weather is like at our other locations. this morning just to find whatever animal will be able to fit in a uh, very good morning 
and welcome to and beyond in gala i'm makas koza and of course on camera i've got mpo there goes some post dump so this morning we are just on a bumble to see whatever animals will be able to see it's not as cold as it was yesterday so this morning it's about 17 degrees celsius which is around 62 degrees fahrenheit not too bad at all it is a beautiful morning the sun looks like it is about to come out so i'm just hoping that as the sun comes out so will these animals that will be able to show to our viewers but yeah like i mentioned it we don't have really any plans since the Birmingham Pride are kind of eluding us at the moment. So for now we'll just be bumbling about and whatever beautiful creatures will come across we'll just show them to the viewers. I just hope it won't be as quiet as it was yesterday because yeah much as sometimes you do see a lot of animals in these bushes but sometimes you will just bend you'll struggle finding these animals like i have mentioned the past couple of days that that's the beauty of the bush sometimes that you won't be able to preempt what's out there what is it that you'll be able to find out so you'll just be surprised as the day goes by So there was me trying to look for tracks because sometimes much as we don't really have any updates you will still be able to find some tracks on the road that might point to you where some animals might have gone and whether or not the track will be fresh that will be worth following up. Yeah, so just stay with me on this bumble. So let's see what it is that we'll be able to see. And we are gonna send you over to Steve in Juma. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome all of you to the dawn. Welcome to the southern reaches of Bufusuk. Hello everybody, my name is Steve, joined this morning by Darren on camera with Darby on board. And we are very excited to have you on board with us. Our objective for this morning is to see if we can find some lion tracks. So far, we're on Bufusuk, we haven't found any. There were some monkeys alarm calling, but the mist is making it very difficult to see. So we're just going to scratch around a little bit on the southern reaches of Bufusuk and see if we can pick up on any sign of the Talamati pride. I feel like a bit of a lion morning. Other than that, we're just going to be driving around, seeing what we can find, investigating the tracks and signs of the bush, seeing what animals have been moving around. As discussed last night, after a period of time, we haven't been here. If you haven't been on a road, tracks can look very, very fresh. Just allow you a moment to just breathe into that sunrise. Absorb the sounds of the African wild.
and foggy misty mornings are the best. It's an indication of the change. There was a very warm patch of weather yesterday. There's a bit of a front pulling in. It's changing the daytime, nighttime temperatures and probably expect a bit of weather change in the coming days. Possibly going to be a little bit colder because, well, it's pretty warm for May. I've only got one pair of gloves on. <laughs> you might hear another vehicle. We did park up next to another vehicle. We were discussing some plans. So they were enjoying the same sunrise we were. So if you do hear the sound of a car, we do apologize. Beautiful morning to be out and about exploring. We have got coffee and we've got good vibes. Amazing how far you can get with a pot of coffee and some good vibes, don't you think, Darren? Indeed. We have received our second batch of name plaques, which is super exciting. And Marcel is busy mounting them as we speak. For those of you that don't know, we are offering the opportunity for Wild Earth Explorers to get their names engraved on a plaque like this. Once your name is on the plaque, it will then be attached onto the vehicle. Marcel, what are you up to? I'm busy mounting plaques on Trusty Rusty. This means that even though you're at home watching this, it'll still feel as though you're on the vehicle with us as we bumble about the bush. This means that VNA, Pratyash, Melanie Greenwood, Linda J. Poli, and Stephen Humbert will be riding along with us as we bumble through the bush, even though you're watching it from home. Now that the name plaques are on the back of the vehicle, it's time for us to head out and go and see what we can find. Founded in 1973, the Endangered Wildlife Trust has consistently and effectively worked towards achieving our conservation legacy. Contribute to this legacy by visiting EWT's Get Wild eShop and purchase products with a purpose. My name is Ross and I'm a field guide at and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. I love getting questions from guests on Wild Earth because I love sharing and learning information about nature with new people and it also makes me feel like you're all joining me in real life. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit your question below our live feed. Baby pangolin. This is off the charts. I'm, uh, yes, I'm. This animal is about from your fingertips to your elbow. That's the total length of this animal. This is unreal. This is unreal. This is unreal. This is like now my fourth Christmas in a week. <laughs> we should do this more often. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Good morning and welcome to Torlu. We start off our morning with a beautiful herd of Grimsbok and somebody that has a bit of an itch. So there's quite a, quite a number of them there in this nice little group. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Deirdre and on camera with me this morning is BK. And it is, it says six degrees, but feels like four. It feels like a whole lot less than four. We've been driving around with the, with the 
the buff right over the nose, it's that chilly. I know it's not quite frostbite, but it feels like it. A really, really icy. We've got a cold front coming through, so it makes uh, the morning temperatures very cold. Morning inspections, mobile. So as the sun comes up, the Genswok will start their grazing for the day and feed through most of the morning. And now as we go into winter, the days are nice and warm for most of the day. There's not excessive heat. So they have the opportunity to actually continue to eat right throughout the day. And then at night, find somewhere to uh, lie down and stay warm. Candice's comment on Gimsburg are stunning antelope. They are indeed, they are one of my favorites. They're just absolutely beautiful with those markings on the face. But certainly an antelope you wouldn't want to mess with, with horns like that. From our beautiful scene, we're going to send you to the next Pride Lens. Certainly is a beautiful scene. A lot of wind last night, bringing a bit of cool air this morning, a bit of moisture, and making that golden glow even better in the morning. What will today bring? I have no idea but hopefully we're going to have a lot of fun. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike. Behind the camera is Glenn, and you're coming to us live here at Eco Training's Pride Lens Conservancy. And it is a crisp and cool morning. The wind has really died down. A lot of moisture in the air, a lot of condensation on everything. The plan for this morning is to head with a sun behind us, sort of in a westerly direction, to see what we might find along the drainage line uh, where animals might be congregating. We know yesterday a herd of buffalo was in the area. We know there have been lions as well calling during the night, so who knows what might be out there. But we are hoping for anything interesting. Creepy crawlies, tracks, signs, big hairy scaries. Who knows? So please don't forget to pop your questions to us. We love to hear from you guys. Answer your questions live on the show via the Wild Earth Explorers page. Or if you're under 18, just pop us a question to kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. We are actually not so far from Indlovo Dam. We're right outside our eco-training camp at the moment. There's a few animals that might come and drink in the early morning. We'll let you know if we find something. Lots of birds making noise now at this early part of the day. Just scanning for the moment, just listening quietly to see if there's anything happening down there towards the dam, which is not so far away from us. Well, it's pretty quiet at the moment, so what we'll do while we find something, we'll send you over to Trishala. It is quite a quiet morning and I was just watching a drongo fight that was going on and now all the drongos have left the tree. I wonder if you can hear them. Yes, that's my best uh, Drongo interpretation right there. Anyway, let's keep on moving because I've got some leopard tracks here on Zoe's. Um, they're not terribly fresh. 
I'm gonna show you what I what I mean, how I can tell it's not terribly fresh. It's probably from early morning. I'll just jump down. Let's see if I can if I can show you. Let me just get a pointy thing, Emmy Jiggy. The chill this morning has given given me a few sniffles. So here, uh, here is the track I'm looking at, or these tracks. So they're for a female leopard, but you can see that there's quite a lot of debris in the tracks. But they're on top of any nocturnal animals' tracks. They're on top of gents' tracks. But there's quite a lot, like if we look in here, there's some debris in here. Even in the one a little further back here, there's some debris to the side of it. Now it could just be that she stepped on top of it, but what I'd want is quite a clear track, and one, if she has stepped on top of it, one that looks quite compressed. In fact, this one here, that debris looks pushed in. Which is, which is great, really, because it means that it's fresher than I first expected. Let's just take a quick walk down here. You can hear hyenas. Again, some debris in the track. This is good. So, you might not be able to see this track very clearly, but there's dew that sits on the ground. You know, it makes the top layer of the ground quite moist. So that top layer of the ground will will give you a good indication of whether it's it's um, it's on top of or underneath that. And this one looks on top of that. So we're going to get back into the vehicle and see if we're lucky. But I also know that a couple, uh, maybe, you know, when we started with the sunrise. At that time, I had actually just come down this road. And um, her tracks were not visible at the top of that road. But I also didn't see any movement or hear anything. But, so I'm thinking basically that it's maybe from an hour ago. Anyway, we're gonna follow up and I'm gonna send you over to Marcus. Apparently he has an animal that I'd like to find this morning, maybe an elephant. Yeah, so good luck to Trisha now with those tricks and finding the elephant. So that one beautiful elephant bull that you see on the screen there, as we are driving here, I just looked over my shoulder and I saw that elephant coming hard at us. It was like it was practically chasing this vehicle and I didn't see it as we were coming in and I had to give it, of course, a bit of gas that will try and get away until he got as relaxed as you can see him now. So now we have parked a good 6 to 70 meters away from him, just so we don't disturb him. As you can see there, he's just feeding. He doesn't look like he's about to come at us at all from what I'm seeing here. Oh, look at that trunk and one of his tusks. What a beautiful tusk he's got on his left. Here we can't see the one on the right, but it looked uh, much shorter than that one that you see on the left there. Because, of course, these elephants like us as humans, they do have got their dominant tusks like that, that they will use the one much more than the other. So that is the case there. You can see playing around with his trunk. Looks like he has stopped feeding. 
I'm not sure what might have agitated him earlier because we didn't really drive close to him and like I mentioned we didn't really see him coming in this area here but we just saw him a couple of minutes later chasing at us and now he does look a little bit relaxed if I can call it that but what a beautiful elephant hey and of course it's not unusual to find an elephant bull like that so Sarah would like to know when do elephants learn to use their trunk so Sarah like when elephants get born like that they are not really sure of how to use the trunk so it's just an accessory of what they really don't know what to do with it so anything from three months that's when they they can start using the trunk but that being mentioned the trunk will still be wobbly like that so i'll say in the early stages of their life they will be still learning how to use that trunk but yeah anything from three months that's when they start using the trunk trying to pick up some stuff and some other stuff will fall of course there goes that other task i was telling you about as you can see it looks broken actually much as these elephants do feed on grasses as you can see they also do feed on trunk of trees that sometimes we will, we will be what breaks their tasks like that but also if there is a standoff when two bulls are fighting like that then they might break their tasks as you can see and so i'll just of course it's about power out here in the bush and we are less powerful than this elephant and it looks like it is a bull in must I'll just try and get away from this area for now. He doesn't look. <laughs> yeah, he's coming for us. <laughs> yeah, some of these older bulls do know how to control that stage of must. It's more the youngsters that are mostly aggressive when they are at this stage of high and testosterone but this looks like a fairly older bull but he doesn't look tolerant at all so while we still try to get away from this elephant we are going to send you over to Deidre in Tualu so I do hope our Marcus and cameraman managed to get away from uh, that elephant they can be quite cheeky when they're in must definitely one thing uh, Tali doesn't have his elephants, so we don't have to deal with uh, cheeky elephants. But uh, I'm just trying to think of what the cheekiest thing I've had to deal with uh, here is. The, cheek oh, yeah. the cheekiest animal I think he's dealt with is the wildebeest near the staff village. He's uh, so relaxed. If, he would, if he's on the road, he's on the road. And you can wait until he decides that he's moving off the road. He just carries on uh, walking down the road at his own leisurely time uh, until uh, he decides that then he'll move off the road. So we've got one little cheeky, cheeky wildebeest that lives near the staff village. He definitely uh, is the owner of the road. So we're heading across the dunes at the moment. We are heading uh, west. The sun is still quite a way away from coming up. So it's still uh, quite crisp and crispy. Some more close book. I'll show you. We'll get into the open clearing. Oh, a whole lot of... Uh, like, oh, there's a little 
skrivskok. <laughs> a small one. His horns are only half the size. That's, uh, that's sort of a three, four year old. With some spunk. So when the sun comes up, that nice little dark patch on the tail there uh, will absorb uh, some of that sun. So you can see them sometimes turning that area towards the sun uh, to absorb uh, some of the heat. But uh, they face, all the animals in the Kalahari have to face the extremes. They either have to, they have to tolerate both very cold and very hot. So sometimes the coloration helps there with that. You see the white lighter underside reflects heat away from all the organs. Uh, and then those little dark rumps, they can put those to get uh, nice and warm. Ingrid is asking, is there a purpose for the black markings on their bodies? Let me just go forward, I'll help you put them back on camera. Um, so yes, the, the black and white markings on their face are to enhance their facial features. Uh, also, at a long distance, they're almost able to see each other. Uh, how about there, Vika? Uh, and uh, it actually, funnily enough, on a, at a long distance in like a mirage or where there's heat, it breaks up the outline of the individual animal as well. So they're not uh, that easy to see. The darker, any, any animal that's dark will be able to absorb heat um, and then the white areas, the lighter areas are to reflect heat. With the black and white on the face as well, the, the, the black just below the eye also helps reduce glare. So when they're busy feeding or moving in the open, open areas, I mean, at the moment we've got a lot of grass, but you can have these areas that it's just totally sand. And your daytime temperatures on these sand, if it's a 40 degree day, the, the heat coming off these surfaces can be anywhere up to 60 degrees. So that way that the black and white is on the face will also uh, reduce the glare. You know, they're also moving quite a lot. Just that movement will uh, keep them warm. So move and nibble and move and nibble and move and nibble will, uh, will help. We're going to continue our mission into the dunes. We all have a busy schedule and a lifestyle which is confined to stress and tensions. For so many of us, the hustle and bustle of a tedious life has meant we have lost our inner peace. Traveling is an ultimate remedy that let us unwind and helps us experience peace in the lap of nature. Wild Earth encourages the benefits of travel by giving away an amazing prize every month. I was totally overwhelmed to receive this fantastic prize of three nights at Chitwa Chitwa. 
Wild Earth has been a life saver for us during that pandemic and has kept us sane. Thank you so very much, Wild Earth. Sign up to be an explorer today and it could be you jetting off on an all expenses paid for safari experience. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. And I find getting out to a local royal park brings me so much closer to nature. I can leave my pain at home. And like watching Wild Earth, I find it's the most amazing way to step out of life's difficulties and just breathe. The chirping and fluttering of these java finches at the feeder in our garden helps us start each day joyfully in connection with nature. So this is our piece of nature that we've been enjoying and that's been keeping us sane during lockdown. This morning we have eight oyster catches on our beach, which is a real treat. Hug a tree, Steve, just for you. I love being a cam up for Wild Earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you. Welcome back to and beyond Gala, everyone. So we did manage to get out of that elephant's way and we are still in one piece, by the way. And as you can see, or as you might have seen earlier, when an elephant bull is in mass like that, it is that temperamental. So like I mentioned earlier that some of these smaller bulls are the ones who can't really, really control their behavior when they are in must like that. But those older bulls, most of them do know how to control themselves even when they're in must like that. So that was a fairly older bull, just that with these animals, like we always mention, they are always wild animals, so we have to give them the respect that they deserve in order for them also to respect us the same way. Because now, you, like you, I mentioned, you can say that it's an older bull, it will know how to control mass like that, and then now it's coming for you. That shows that these animals match as we work close to them on daily basis you sometimes can't really tell what they can do so the best thing to do in these situations will be to give them the respect that they deserve but yeah we have moved away from that elephant now we are still bumbling about we don't really have any updates of the birmingham pride as yet Pamela, it will depends. Hey, those all these animals, uh, it will depend on individuals. But yeah, they can be in must for a long time sometimes. And also, that being said, these youngsters, when it comes to these more smaller bulls, even if they are in must like that, you find that they're in bachelor associations with more older bulls that will suppress the must in the small ones. So yeah, that always varies with individuals, if I, if I can put it like that. So I like I don't really want to put time to it because that might be misleading at some point. But yeah, these elephants can be in must for a, a long time, matter of weeks even. As you saw that one that we saw earlier.
Yeah, so while we are still bumbling to see whatever we'll be able to see next, we are going to send you over to Mike in Pridelands who has got something for our viewers. So it is super interesting what we found. Hi everyone. This in front of me uh, is a termite mound, or at least the spout of a termite mound. Now, this type of termite, this particular species, doesn't make those huge termite uh, mounds that you see. They kind of um, have a subterranean termite colony, and they just create these spouts in order to uh, release some of the built-up warm, uh, moist air. Now, I think you've, if you've been watching for a while, you understand that termites eat dead material, grasses, leaves, wood, all that stuff that's dead and dry. Now, what they do is they take it underground. They don't eat it directly. They don't take a piece of grass and just eat it. They don't have the, the right uh, stomach contents, acids, uh, bacteria to break it down. So they take it underground and they cultivate these little fungus gardens, which are amazing. So they literally have chambers filled with these fungus and they put the grasses and dead wood there by the fungus. The fungus then breaks it down into something that the termites can eat. That process is called metabolizing. And in, when the fungus metabolizes the grasses, they break it down, they decompose it, it creates heat and warmth. I don't know if any of you have a uh, compost heap at home, um, especially if you live in somewhere cold in Europe or the UK. Um, we used to have a compost heap, and if you dig a small hole into it, you'd see steam rising out of that hole. The same thing is happening underground here. And if I put my hand over this termite mound, I can literally feel feel the warmth coming out of that. There's a stream of warm air just pouring out of this. And it's super cool. And so this is actually something that a lot of animals take advantage of. Sometimes hornbills will perch on the edges of these termite mounds, fluff their feathers out, allowing that warm air to heat them up, allowing them to break down the foods and warm up much quicker. Other animals like um, mongoose will sometimes live inside these mounds in order to stay warm as long as they don't disturb the termites. Now, it's very important that we check these things before sticking your hands um, into them because they can be incredibly deep and they can be home for lots of things. I've got a head torch here. I'm just going to shine it down in there. I don't know if it's going to work, if you'll be able to see in there, but it's incredibly deep. This here is at least two meters deep, maybe three meters deep down in there. I checked it very carefully before just to make sure that no uh, snake or anything was going to pop out and try and, and try and bite me, but it's super cool and super deep. So be very careful. Don't drop something down there because it will be gone forever. So Amber, that's a good question. Termites have built uh, this termite mound over many over many years. So this is a small mound. What they do is the the male and female, a queen and a king, during the summer will have erupted out of a previous termite mound, met up somewhere, dropped to the ground, and then they'll start digging right there in that spot. And over time, they excavate, make chambers. The queen then starts to lay eggs, and those then become workers who excavate more tunnels because termites cannot survive above ground. They don't have the right uh, pigment called melanin in their body to protect them from the UV radiation of the sun. So over, over many, many years, they've dug these subterranean burrows and they move the soil out of the ground and create these, um, uh, this is a spout or a, or a chimney. But on, some of, the, on the, some of the families, you'll see a huge mound, sometimes meters and meters tall, many meters wide. That's all soil that was excavated from underground. That's why termites are super important, because by bringing that nutrient-rich soil from underground to the surface, they make sure that this surface area here becomes very, very um, nutrient-rich, and then animals that feed on this uh, can get those nutrients, and it continues that uh, ecological cycle, the nutrient cycle that allows everything to live here in the savanna biome. Remember, we talked about yesterday how the, the, the surface layer of the soil is very thin, so by, by the termites bringing this up, they increase that, that soil composition, they increase the nutrient load and they make it very, very viable for many things. So it's really cool that the termites are doing this. And you can just, just to show you how, how much moisture there is in the air today, if I just pick up this one leaf here, I put it in the, in the sun here, just look at how much moisture is in the air. Just this leaf sitting on the ground is absolutely covered in condensation. Well, what we're going to do now is send you over to Deirdre, I think, who's got some cool stuff.
we do have indeed have some cool stuff. We've uh, got a very nice journey of giraffe <laughs> that are in the sun. We're in the shadow on the dune at the moment. We are. The sun is coming. It's creeping, creeping slowly towards us. But uh, a very, very nice group of giraffe. All just busy, busy feeding on the camel thorns. have pretty much eaten most of the camel thorn seed pods off uh, the camel thorn trees that they can reach. It's a really nice uh, protein package. And they'll also eat uh, these seed pods off the black thorns. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> he's the, he's, he's, uh... Oh, there's one to the far. What do you have there? Oh, just a... <laughs> we thought we saw something else. But there's just one, two, three, four, five. Small journey. And it looks like mostly females. Females and, and uh, their offspring, there's definitely a size difference between them. Hannah is asking the question, are there different giraffe species? Uh, yes, Hannah. This particular species is known as the southern giraffe. Uh, and then you get geographically distinct populations. So depending on where you are in Africa would depend on what species of giraffe you would get. If you were up in Kenya, it would be the Maasai giraffe. Um, you get Angolan in Angola, Nubian, thorny crafts, a uh, thorn... Thorny, yes, it is thorny cross. Rothschilds, so different giraffe in different areas. But the whole of Southern Africa and all the properties that come to you uh, at the moment all have the same species, the Southern giraffe. So the yeah, even though we're out in the more arid regions, this, it's the same giraffe as what you would see on Pinda or Ingala or Juma. And all that, all that varies on the giraffe. They're all tall. They, uh, the only thing that varies is the the pattern, basically the sort of the way that the pattern. So these giraffe tend to have very jagged little edges on their brown patches. Uh, Maasai giraffe have very sort of thin stripes and almost clearer blocks uh, that are uh, they're a lot darker. The sun is coming slowly, BK. It's creeping towards us. We'll start getting a bit warmer soon. I think we're aiming for about a 24 degree day today. We're gonna send you uh, back to Mike, who's got something interesting to show you. Deirdre is absolutely right. This is very interesting, and we can feel the warmth of the sun. This little thing here that we just saw on the ground as I was walking, I saw this slimy-looking thing, but it's not slimy. It's actually very dry. It's just got a bit of moisture on it. This is called a puffball fungus. So if I show you why it's called a puffball, um, in the light, I don't know if you'll see it, 
you see those brown spores coming out of this thing. Vert, the, oh, the, vert. I tried to say those and that at the same time. Gosh, I'm getting tongue-tied so early in the morning. That is how these things reproduce. All of that brown stuff coming out are spores. So fungus don't have seeds or anything like that. They just have spores that come out. When those land, uh, they can start to grow into another puffball fungus. So it's important that we don't breathe too much of this stuff in. <coughs> just put it straight into my face. Hopefully I haven't got too much. Because fungus is not good for you. Some, some is good. I mean, when you think about um, penicillin, it's a type of fungus. It's very good antibacterial properties, keeps us safe from, from infections, kills bacteria, and all sorts of things. But this puffball fungus is not uh, necessarily toxic to us, but those spores can develop inside of us. So we don't want too much of it in us. But puffballs are not edible. Some of them can be extremely toxic, um, but they're very common at this time of year, and they're very um, obvious. This one is an old one that's sort of breaking down and sort of crumbling. If I open it up inside, you can see it just looks like a piece of cotton wool that has absorbed a, a bunch of dust. Yeah. Probably also very, very flammable, probably a good fire starter because of the fibrous nature of it. But when they're very fresh and young, it looks like a golf ball. It's literally a white, perfectly round cylinder, and it won't have any funguses yet, only once it dries like this. This is what we call the fruiting body of a fungus, okay? And puffballs, true puffballs like this, don't have any stem or gills or a hood or anything like that. It's just a circle, just like we see now. I actually thought it was an onion. You know we have baboons and monkeys that sometimes come into our camp. And we're not so far from the camp now, maybe like five, six hundred meters. So I thought, oh man, the monkey's stolen an onion. I'm glad I picked it up because it's a really cool puffball. And now you can see really nicely. Look at all that stuff coming out. Mark, it is fascinating, you know. This is, might be the biggest of these that I've seen for, a, well, ever, really. I mean, usually they're very small, not much bigger than a thumb or a, or a knuckle. So this one is a really, really big uh, puffball. And they're, you know, worldwide. You can find them everywhere. I remember uh, playing with these as a, actually, uh, Glenn and I were just saying, like when you were a kid, you used to play with these, throw them around and kick them and stuff, and like, like watching these little brown spores coming out. That's really quite cool. Yeah, but don't eat them. They can be toxic. It really looks like it's on fire. That's so interesting. Yeah, but it's a nice morning, actually. We were just actually heading up to a... To, a, to an area that was burnt recently. We want to see what kind of life is, is appearing now a few days after the area got burnt to see, because often you can see here a little bit of green grass is growing here. So burnt areas often encourage the growth of green material like this. So in a few minutes, we'll be heading up to that area and we'll go and have a bit of a, bit of a gander what's going on. But whilst we make our way up there, we'll send you over to Steve, who's at a waterhole. Welcome back to Bivolsuk. Welcome to Rubbing Post Dam, everybody. We, we had um, been on the trail of a male leopard for a little while. And unfortunately, we were just finding ourselves getting further and further away from broadcast signal. So we've come back. Having a nice little chill moment here. I was rubbing post dam and watching how the water has receded somewhat, but still looking pretty good for the winter months I haven't seen this in the dry season so I don't know how deep it is but definitely with the number of watching holes it's still quite full it bodes very well for many of our animals the coming dry season last moment is you just sort of sit back and enjoy some sounds of some birds in the background
we're going to move on from here, see if we can find any more tracks and send you back over to Trish on Juma. Well, I hope that he does find some tracks. Our tracks actually went went for quite a while. So it came down Zoe's, it went south on Zoe's, took that game path off to the east, came out in Philemon's cut line, then came towards Treehouse Dam and I lost them there around just before Treehouse Dam. So now I've just gone around Treehouse Dam and there were no tracks on this on this eastern side. So now I'm moving on Shibamu or on, I'm gonna meet up with Shibamu and see if that, if the tracks come out there. But I've definitely not picked up anything on this side. Hi Kevin, you'd like to know what else we can tell from animal tracks? I assume you mean like apart from the direction in which they're going and what animal it is, you can tell the sex of the animal. So leopard tracks, the female tracks are smaller than male tracks and the only thing that you could really confuse it with is uh, a young male's leopard tracks. Um, apart from that there's not too much, oh you can tell if an animal has a limp, um, you can tell if an animal has some other type of oddity, maybe um, one just on the other side you know it's difficult to see them sometimes um, you might be able to tell if one uh, of the claws of the animal is unsheathed something like that oh. Dakers are so good at <laughs> running away but it's that kind of information that we that we can tell from tracks but not too much else because remember that any animal that leaves tracks is not aware of the fact that they've left tracks and that someone else can follow follow them. Apart from, from us, we know that we leave tracks in the sand when we walk, but really, how aware of it are you? Not, not that much, unless someone brings it to your attention or you're walking on beach sand, you don't really think about the fact that you leave tracks as you walk. Because it's a, it's a result of your presence and most of the time we're not too aware of those things. So ultimately it's just giving us information about the movements of an animal. This is the main spot. This is going to tell us if she's moved out of our property or not. So that's actually it. Get down here. You'd like to know if there's still any tracks that confuse me? Definitely. Um, I think I've asked, I've been asked, sorry Susan, I've got my head down here. Um, I have uh, been asked before and I've said it before as well that it's, it's usually animals that you don't spend time tracking. Like small mammals, um, birds. So I can tell it's a bird track, but you know which bird created that track. Sometimes it's easier to tell with with things like Cape turtle doves just because of their of their movements because they tend to walk on the road you would have seen them walking on the road in fact there's one doing it for us right there I'll show it to you so the track looks very generic it's just you know a bird track but in fact it can uh, when
when you look at it, you'll be able to tell because you, we're watching it do its movements right here. So stop here and I'll watch this dove. Lots of the doves walk in this pattern. So whether it's a Cape Turtle Dove or Emerald Spotted Wood Dove, like these guys, they walk, can you see that they walk round in that kind of pattern across the roads? So when you see that track, it's most likely gonna be one of them. Unfortunately, there's no tracks examples that I can see right now. But those still confuse me. Um, like I said, small, small mammals, um, insects. Like, you know, you can tell it's an insect or maybe you can tell it's an arthropod. Um, but not too much else. I don't see any tracks coming out on this side, so I'm going to turn more towards the east and see if I can see any tracks coming out. We're just going to reverse safari for a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna wake, make my way also on the southern boundary, but a little bit more towards the, the east. So hopefully we'll be able to find some tracks. But I'm gonna send you over to Marcus, who's also tracking. Hopefully his is a little bit more fruitful than mine. Uh, I had that question. We, we do like me myself personally. I do get a lot of tracks that still confuse me, of course. But yeah, I am still out here in the bush. I'm sure with time I will be able to tell most of these tracks. But yeah, that being said, there are some of the tracks that I do know. Some tracks are easy to identify than others of course but yeah especially all the big animals you will most likely be able to tell the difference between those so those tracks are what we are looking for at the moment to be able to point us to these animals that we are so hoping to see and there is some good news about Birmingham Pride as well. Not all of them, of course. So there is one lioness. I'm sure the viewers might have seen these cubs over the days or even weeks. There is that one lioness that has got the two young cubs. So there are updates that she has been found, which is a very good thing. And here, where we are now, we earlier had some lion audio that sounded like they come from somewhere in this area so we are still looking and then time and again yeah we do switch off and try and listen they haven't called recently but like i mentioned so we'll be looking for those tracks if we do find them along these roads here will be able to tell maybe the general direction and then we'll narrow down the search like that and it's not just myself looking for them we we do have other guides that are helping on the search as well which also it's quite nice and i just hope that our search as well will be fruitful at the end of the day fingers crossed Uh, so the other members of the pride haven't been found as yet. It's just that. Yeah, so Johnny is saying he's always ready for a bumble. Yeah, Johnny, you know, sometimes bumbles can find you stuff as well. You can get surprised with beautiful stuff because the bush has got a lot to offer of course. So 
Yeah, bumbles like this sometimes are fruitful at the end. So we are in this nice thick vegetation here that if there are some lions maybe lying on the ground it won't be as easy to see them especially because these grasses here when the lions are lying flat on the grasses they blend quite well with these grasses so it's only maybe when they raise their head that you will be able to see them the black on the back of their ears and also the black tip of the tail because time and again you'll find that they will switch it like that and then you will be able to see so you just have to look hard and i don't think where we are now there are some lions resting but yeah we'll just keep bumbling about so hoping that they do show themselves or avail themselves to us so there are some also water holes that i have checked earlier with no luck as well of these lions so we'll just have to keep looking for them and hopefully we'll be able to get better results i'm just switching off the can listen to looks like that lion that called earlier has stopped calling but if it does call we'll be able to hear and then we'll keep closing in to the general direction of where we think the call might be coming from we'll head it towards some nice and open areas now That is not as thick as where we just drove past. And I see some very relaxed impala rams on my right here, which will indicate that there are not any lions close by here, because these impalas are the ones that sometimes will point predators your way by giving an alarm call and also looking interested in one direction where they think that the threat might be coming from. Yeah, so we'll keep going about in this bumble and then yeah hopefully we'll be able to find these lions take 27 i'm carol from chicago usa this is me five years ago no music no editing real time i was hooked thank you so much for that wilder i had lost my job and I also lost one of my pets. So Wild Earth has seen me through very hard times. And I just want to thank all of you for being there for me when I needed you most. We love you. We start and end our day with you, teaching our grandkids all about nature through you, your wonderful educational safaris. We really do appreciate being on safari with you, especially when it's cold and wintry in Canada. And considering we've been in lockdown for 18 months here in Saudi and I've not been able to fly back to South Africa, I want to thank you for bringing your safari back into my life every single day and night. I love it, love it, love it. The Mara Triangle is a jewel in the Kenyan conservation crown. And thanks to the dedication of the Mara Conservancy, it thrives as one of Earth's greatest national treasures. We have been experiencing a reduction in the waste nets that uh, we collect on a monthly basis. And this is basically attributed to our intense patrols. Over the years, this courageous team of anti-poachers has reduced poaching to almost zero. I'm United Stephen, Oleso. I'm a fan of the city of the city of the city of the city Wenye utua sana sana ina ugofia ni wale wanyawa na enda kama ndofu. Kiwa natumia kama bunduki 
As a result of the global pandemic and the massive reduction in tourist revenue, the Mara Triangle is facing a financial crisis. They need your help if they are to continue their ability to protect this magical land. My name is Lauren and I'm currently working in Juma Private Game Reserve here in South Africa. I love answering your questions during the live safaris. It's my favorite part. It feels like you're on the vehicle with me and I'm able to teach you exactly what you want to know. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, you must go to the live safari page and ask your question below the live feed. We have returned to the heart of Juma. And have a look at some of our come up with. This is sort of clearing, but the there's a bit of a bank cloud coming in from the east. There's a skewering to a degree, which has uh, forced me to put my gloves back on, but that's all right. Lovely, I love it when it's this temperature. It means there's still a good opportunity or chance for some of our big and hairies to still be moving. Vubu Road coming in from Bivosuk and we'll be at uh, Vuitella Dam shortly. The scene of yesterday's carnage was uh, quite something to behold. The dog energy was very strong yesterday. Might check this dam and then head up towards Bifusuk and see what's going on up that side. But while we make our way towards the water, let's send you over to Prylands and Mike and see what he's got to show you. So what you're seeing there is the smoldering end of a dead log. Now, this is a burnt area, as you can see looks pretty lifeless and dead. This was burnt about three days ago along our uh, south, southern boundary of Pride Lands. Now, fire is devastating when used incorrectly, but on these small game reserve areas and in the savanna biome, as we're talking about the savanna biome quite a lot, fire is hugely important. Savannah is savannah because of the occurrence of regular fires. Now, this fire was a short cool fire, what they call a cool fire, that burns relatively slowly on cool days against the wind, nice and quickly it moves through an area just to take out some of the grass. It also prevents the woody dominance of tree species that will take over an area, trees like sickle bushes. Now this fire particularly was used to stop the spread of an uncontrolled fire that might rip through pride lands and cause huge amount of damage. Right along our boundary where there's roads and cars and people anything could happen. But I want you to show you this over here. Just at the base of this grass here. It's all been burnt to the top, but at the bottom, shoots are coming out. Now that is something hugely important to note. In the savanna biome, most of our trees are adapted, most of our plants, in fact, are adapted to the occurrence of regular fires. They've got uh, growth points right at the bottom like this, protected from the fire. The energy in the roots comes out and pushes out. This stimulates the growth of this green material, which will now also bring lots of grazing animals into the area. Our trees mostly have fire-resistant bark, and so fires like these happen in nature, in natural systems that are open, completely untouched by humans. Between every 5 and 15 years, a fire will occur naturally through a lightning strike or um, 
you know, a whole bunch of a piece of dew on a grass that's very dry at this time of year. Anything could happen. So this area we're going to be keeping an eye on over the next few weeks to see how it progresses, how it develops, how the grasses start to come back, what animals might be moving into this area. Because this ash also now creates a carbon-rich fertilizer that will be put back into the soil as animals and, and we walk here, we crush it into the ground. And there's already also lots of ants. Look over here, there's some sugar ants just on this pile of, of grass. There's a spider moving through there. So these sugar ants that you can just see, there's one just here by my finger. Oh, now it moves in. This grass is also producing sugary uh, sap from the ends that protects it from drying out as it grows. And the ants are after that. So there's so much life in this area, in this thin strip of burnt area right along our southern boundary. It's quite amazing to see the resilience of life here in the savannah areas. Oh, and there's a spider. I wonder if that spider's going to catch the ant. Or it might just be moving away from us, to be honest. So now we're expecting a bit of rain to happen tomorrow, just a small amount, which will also make a huge difference because now a little bit of a drizzle, just wetting that top layer of soil, helps this nutrients, this carbon to go back into the soil and then allows uh, these grasses to come back quite strongly. Now we have different types of fires that are used um, in the management of small reserve areas such as this. There are hot fires to remove encroaching alien vegetation or even woody pioneers like sicklebush. And that's a slow burning fire on a, on a not windy day uh, that will basically destroy those plants that are taking over an area unnaturally. Well, you have what's called a cool burn, which happens on a, on a humid day with a fair amount of breeze that allows the fire to move swiftly over the surface layer without damaging uh, the woody plants. This is just to remove what we call moribund material. When too much grass grows and, and makes a fat layer, Anna Marie, it is, it is amazing how fire encourages fresh growth. Remember, fire is a naturally occurring thing that happens in nature. And so when, what we were having before here, because of Pride Lands being separate from the Kruger Park, lack of elephants, really reduced number of animals, we were having a thick layer of dead grass that was creating a mat about this thick. And that, that really stops the penetration of sunlight. It stops the penetration of water. It creates an area where nothing is really growing. We just get dead grass. And so by removing that, allowing sun to filter into here, allowing seeds and rainfall and sun, it's really going to stimulate so much growth now. I'm really excited to see. I mean, look, even this grass over here. Bright green, just emerald coming up at the bottom there. It's really, really awesome to see this kind of stuff can't wait to see in about three days time four days time just how much more of this green will there be we'll actually start to see mostly less of this dark material the the, the burnt uh, grass blades and we'll start to see this emerald sheen on the surface will be very exciting and Maria I hope you follow the progress It'll be exciting to to see how it progresses All right, we're going to send you over to Tswalu and Deirdre, who's also on a bumble. So we're just uh, bumbling in our grasslands down south. Uh, and uh, we do, we anticipate fire this year because we've got such a heavy fuel load uh, from the really, really good rains. But uh, most of the time in these areas, it's going to be a lightning strike that'll cause uh, the grass to catch on fire. And then uh, we'll see how it goes uh, from there. But uh, fires are never a bad thing. They just uh, put the nutrients back into the soil and start again. But uh, you're always in one small area where, in any area, if it's already fenced, then you wouldn't want it to destroy too much all in one go. But that recovery is always amazing. And it's amazing how the animals know to come straight into those areas uh, as soon as uh, there's been some rain. So out in the grasslands here, Lisa 
is asking what happened to the flowers that were in my car for the last two days. So I think uh, <laughs> Obi is probably not such a flower person, but uh, I got BK to pick these uh, one night when we were with the lions. Uh, and this is actually uh, a wild camphor. So at the time I didn't know which one it was. I had a suspicion that that is what it was. So I used uh, the book to check. Uh, and it is a wild camphor. So unfortunately you can't smell it, but if you do crush the leaves, you do smell it. Sorry, to be, I'm trying to hold it still, but my fingers are freezing. So it is literally uh, shaking because uh, my fingers even inside my gloves are rather chilly. That grass doesn't belong there. Um, so a really, really pretty. And generally, if you do look at some of the leaves, I don't know if you can see the leaves, but they, they would be referred to as bicolor. So dark on the top side uh, and then lighter on the underside. And uh, they are sort of velvety, very, very nice and velvety. And those hairs will often help the plants uh, in absorbing moisture and also preventing too much water loss. So a very, very pretty wild camphor. And it was the only one I'd seen, so we hadn't seen uh, that many. It was on the base of the mountain. Uh, and the birds will use these little cotton balls uh, to line their nests. So they'll come and they'll pick them and then they'll add uh, that to their nest. It'll be a nice, warm, natural fiber that they can add to their nest. So that's what's happened to the flowers. Obi, Obi doesn't... Uh, I'll put them back where they were so you can uh, enjoy them while we drive. <laughs> Tony is asking the question, can it be used to uh, make anything that humans can use? I don't know. I don't know if you can make a wild camphor if it's like a, a tea or... Give me a second. Uh, I'll have to uh, get my book. Uh, and we'll find it, and we will see. We'll see what the book says about uh, camphor. We've got a really, really awesome book. It's called Flowering Plants of the Kalahari. Uh, and fortunately, uh, there's actually not that many trees, but it's always best to uh, in the book if I can find the uh, wild. Where did it go? My fingers are too cold to even turn the page. Uh, Camperbush, page 51. There we go. Let's see what the book says. So, Tarkinanthus camphoratus is its uh, fancy scientific name. It belongs to the daisy family, actually, which is quite interesting. Uh, browsed by wildlife. The wood is used for furniture, musical instruments, uh, an infusion and tinctures of the leaves and twigs for abdominal pain and headaches. And... The smoke from the fresh or dried part plant is inhaled for asthma, headaches, and rheumatism. And the leaves medicinally as a perfume. And then it says they're also smoking the dried leaves in a pipe has a slight narcotic effect. But very pretty. So a camphor bush. Oh, sorry, BK. <laughs> Put my hat. So, a very nice uh, flowering plants of the Kalahari, Noel and Gretel van Royen. And if it wasn't for the van Royens, uh, we probably wouldn't know much about what's going on in our plants in the Kalahari. Uh, it's an amazing book for us. Uh, definitely uh, don't go anywhere without it. And uh, it is a, to the contrast from what we were seeing after the first rains in that sort of January, February time with all the flowers is amazing. So I'm not too sure, uh, but we're going to send you across uh, to Trishal. I didn't hear the full uh, thing there, but we'll send you to Trishal. This kudu is just beautiful. It's on top of a termite mound. It's got its head held high. And he's looking off into the distance. And the reason I stopped besides the fact that he's stunning right there is that he's trying to give himself a bit of height, extra height, to have a look at something. Perhaps something that's a predator, something that's a threat, but he hasn't alarmed. But I want to sit and watch him because it's such a beautiful stance. He's probably about a meter and a half, maybe even two meters off the ground on that termite mount. So he's very, very tall there.
That's all, pretty much all, almost it's his height above the ground. And he's been standing like this row. I mean, it wasn't because of us that he was standing there. He was there when we arrived. So I'm really hoping that he's seen something that maybe he doesn't like. Like a leopard. Hi, Critter Freak, you say what a pose. Certainly a very, very beautiful pose. And look at these horns. They're not very large, they still have a way to go, but he's got these really deep curls. The spirals are deep. And I love when we see that. Sometimes you'll find the, lo the horns can be quite long, but the spirals are a little bit shallow. He's a nice and deep, so when he gets that, those additional curls going, he's gonna be a very, very stunning kudu bull. He's lost his concentration a bit now. So whatever it was that, that first got his attention, he's probably moved off. And we're now on the eastern side of the reserve on Cheetah Cut Line. And we're gonna make our way to Buffalzook Dam, see if we can get some elephants, things like that, see if there's any, any sign of any other kind of tracks or leopards on this side because those leopard tracks they had like I said to you when I said to you I'm going to turn a little bit more east and see if they come out or come out they certainly did and they went on to little gallery oh look at him he's moving through that round leaf teak Hi, Lily Pan. You'd like to know if it's a hump that they've got in their back. It is a hump in the sense that it is a rounded part of their back, but it is not a hump in a, um, in a camel sense. So they're very muscular animals, and that's where their shoulders attach to their body. So they need strong muscle in that area, as well as fat, for them to be able to have good movement. And they, oh, you can also tell that they have quite a slope, a bit of a slope to their body, and that, oh, off he goes in the distance now. So that hump is just a result of the, of the structure of their, of their shoulders going all, imagine if we had, like if someone who's built like me suddenly just developed massive shoulders, probably have a hump too. of shoulder blade muscles, whatever those are called. He was really, really beautiful. Ooh, there we go. Come on, Wendy. You're a good girl. Hi, Sarah. He'd like to know if kudus are territorial. Not really, bulls can become, or bulls can be territorial, but you'll also find them in loose aggregation. So kudus and, in fact, most antelope, um, particularly that we get around here, are not territorial all the time. There's certain times of the year when they're territorial, there's certain times when their age, certain age, that they're more, more territorial than other times. But you'll find kudus in bachelor herds. But sometimes they will feel a little bit territorial. And that's a result of, that's a result of testosterone in their bodies. And that's usually when they want to mate. You'll see kudus 
with females and their calves. Sometimes you see them without females and calves. Sometimes you'll see just bachelor heads. So they can be quite loose um, in those aggregations. see too many tracks and cheetah cut line. Not a single leopard track. Not yet at least. So off to my right is Torchwood. Um, and obviously if I see something cool, I'll turn in there, but for now there's nothing that's telling me that there's any promise in Torchwood. So usually I look for tracks at junctions, turning eastward into Torchwood. The soil here in Cheetah Katha is really nice for tracking, so I enjoy it. Anyway, I'm not the only one tracking. Marcus is two. Let's go over to him. I'm wishing him all the luck. Thanks, Trishala. So far, it looks like we do need luck. But yeah, we... We are still in that area where we are looking for the what we think is a male lion that called earlier. So it might probably be even one of the Ross males. But yeah, that always waits to be seen. And so far we haven't been that luck. So if Mpo can frame this block on my right or to my right, so this is where the track cut in from the other loop road in this block. It looks like it's heading this way. So I'm driving this road here to see if maybe I will be able to pick up the tracks of him crossing the road into the other into the other block. But so far, nothing. So no tracks are coming out, which makes me think that there is a good possibility that this lion might still be in this block to our right here. In which case, there is one other ranger who's helping me and the such, like I mentioned earlier. So chances are his tracker might come off the vehicle and even try following those tracks into this block and hopefully he will have a better luck in there but yeah we are still looking so i haven't driven the whole of this stretch of the road so that the tracks might even come out somewhere up here where i was still driving to you you can't really tell for the time being come again with that question uh, so Patrick wants to know if all animals have got distinct tracks yes Patrick like a whole different of animals have got a whole different tracks that we can use to follow them. However, there are some that are similar, like those of leopards and lions. They are very, very similar. But of course, lions are much bigger than leopards. So if you do see a track like that, that looks very similar to that one. 
and it's small then you will know of course that it's likely to be a leopard because if it's lions being that small chances are they will be with their mother or at least one member or older member of the family in which case they will be also a bigger track close to those small ones so there are some that are similar there are some that are completely different but yeah all of them like Trishala mentioned earlier all of them do have stories to tell so you can really tell a lot from looking at these tracks which in our case out here in the bush when we are looking for these animals they help a great deal Still bumbling about in the central parts of the reserve. And then we hope that maybe we'll do see these tracks coming out of one road or another. That will be quite cool because then we will be able to tell where the animal might be. But also we'll be able to follow it up on foot if we can especially if we are looking for these bigger lions maybe older ones like the rose males that do not really have those youngsters because those ones you can track so it's more the ones with the youngsters that you might want to try stay away from and yeah sometimes when you track and also because these animals would be they will be aggressive to you especially if they do have smaller ones and also if you find like a mating pair also those ones will be really really aggressive but also if you do follow them up and then if they are mating you will be able to hear the sounds of which you will be able to tell that there are baby Yeah, and also when they are on the kill as well, so you will have to be aware of those when they are feeding because they can be aggressive as well. But yeah, we are still keeping up with our search and now we are going to send you over to Tswalu. Let's see what they've got at the water hole. So what we have is uh, <clears throat> a group of glossy starlings just enjoying the morning sun on top of the trees. We are near a water hole. We uh, came here to see if there's anything that's come down to drink, but nothing other than the glossy starlings in the tree. And they just are enjoying the morning sun. The temperature's definitely starting to slowly increase. And I, do, I do say slowly. I see, I was uh, ambitious at 24 degrees. I see uh, we're going to get like 17 <laughs> most today. So. The cold front is certainly here. So those starlings just busy going through some sort of preening. They'll fetch oil from the oil gland, from the preen gland at the base of their tail and then zip it through their feathers to make sure they're just keeping everything maintained. Uh, they're enjoying the sun. Sometimes uh, the sun also, if they start getting quite warm, will help dislodge, dislodge any parasites, uh, and then they can shake and hopefully get rid of those. But uh, before they spend the entire day flying, they just uh, do some feather maintenance. I've seen some even very brave birds, particularly the ducks, don't mind bathing in the early in the early mornings in the water. I just think that that's incredibly icy, very cold. It's all just <laughs> slow, slow movements, one branch at a time. We're actually on the wrong side of them to get that beautiful iridescent blue with a nice orange eye that the glossy starlings generally have.
KG's asking the question. I think I've pretty much uh, beat you to it with the answer. They're like a iridescent blue, depending on which way the sunlight hits them and the light is refracted off their feathers. Um, you can get them to sort of a purple, a blue, uh, a black, just depending on which way they turn in the sun. There are also other birds that are enjoying the early morning uh, sun. Is uh, There's some doves in the trees as well on the other side of the waterhole. They were also here earlier. Everybody straight up on the top of the trees just enjoying that early morning sun. That looks like uh, some Cape turtle doves. Oh, uh, you go another two bushes over because there's a lot more there. Yeah, there we go. You can just see everybody's on the top of the trees just uh, warming up. That looks like a combination. Looks like there's some laughing doves in there as well. Anyone with a sort of like a pinky, pinky purple is the laughing dove. And then anything with a black collar across the back of the neck and slightly larger will be a cape turtle dove. But uh, nobody's really flying around too much or calling now. They're just uh, enjoying the sun. So for them, it's also safety in numbers. Uh, they can come down and drink their water in numbers. And Cameron is asking the question, how do birds balance on such thin twigs? They're very fortunate in that most of the perching birds, which is both the dove and the starling, have three three toes facing forward and one toe facing backwards. So they close it over the branch and that basically forms like a tight circle and they can hold on uh, that way. So it definitely does uh, help. Doesn't help if your friend nearly knocks you out the tree, though. And, and we thought the meerkats are the only ones that enjoy the morning sun. Just seen a jackal sneaking in. He's peeping on the other side of the tree there. He's literally just got his head sticking out on the left side of that bush. There he goes. Got him? Left, yeah, there we go. Nice. A black back jackal. So the jackals sometimes hang around the edges of the water because the sand grass and the doves come down and drink in the early morning uh, and sometimes they can rush at the edge of the water and because the sand grass can't go through the water they have to fly back towards the jackal uh, and then you might be able to jump and catch them so i've yet to see that i'm still waiting to see it but i've seen many a picture and film footage of the jackals doing that We're going to move away from the waterhole. There doesn't seem to be any uh, bigger animals that are coming to the water, and we'll carry on on our search.
Do you dream of an African holiday in unparalleled luxury? Where your days are spent in the company of wildlife and cooling off in your very own plunge pool? Well, this month's prize may be the one for you. Expertly camouflaged into the unspoiled environment of the world-famed Sabi Sand Game Reserve, it's hard not to fall in love with Simbambili. Sign up to be a wild earth explorer before the end of May and you and a friend could be jetting off to this ultimate escape from reality. A luxurious safari and spa getaway wrapped up in one impressive package. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. The Endangered Wildlife Trust fights at the forefront of conservation, across the vast Karoo and sweeping grasslands, in remote pockets of forest, along road networks, across African skies, and in communities to conserve our wildlife and wild spaces. Help us to protect forever, together. Donate now at ewt.org.za. It's a huge privilege to be in these incredible places with these amazing animals. I love forming lions. When they do get up and do something, it's always spectacular. When they are playing, are incredibly fun to watch, especially sub and cubs. I love being in the bush and working in these incredible places with these amazing animals. We want to bring it to you so that you can almost feel like you're right there and in, be able to experience it and enjoy it the way we are. Guys, have a look at what we've got. This is better than my birthday. Look at that. This is the first time that I ever see cubs this small. Th this is so special. This has officially just become my best sighting of all times. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. There are some very emerald spot, very emerald spotted wood doves, very pretty emerald spotted wood doves just in front of us on the road. And what's quite nice is that it allowed us to come quite close. Usually they'll fly off. I think that they're underappreciated birds. Maybe it's because they're tough to get on camera that we don't see them as much and get the opportunity to appreciate them. But they're very, very pretty. Those emerald spots are just... So often they just look dark and that's because it's a result of that structural coloration. So. When there isn't much light around, they just look like dark spots. But now you can see with the sunlight how, how iridescent they are. Really, really, like the namesake, really emerald. And so often we don't get the opportunity to see them like this. Or if we do, it's just a flash of that emerald green. I also think they're quite cute, they're quite small from the doves. Very compact. Now these guys are omnivorous, so usually they'll go after basically anything small, nice bits of grass, grass seeds, as well as little termites. That's usually what they'll go after, even some fruit but um, grass seeds, even seeds of, of other plants and termites is what they're usually eating. And that's why you find them on the road a lot. Where their beaks digging in, tucking into anything that they can find. when you say you like how the birds wobble when they walk they do they do wobble quite a bit um, <laughs> it's 
is quite funny. And she's talking about the wobbling of their of their actual bodies on the legs. In this case right here, it's probably a result of dropping their body. So they're kind of pushing their body down onto the legs to keep the legs a little warmer. Um, because the legs have no uh, no feathers on them, right? So it's a part of the body that they can use, they can lose heat to very easily. So you'll find that they're a little lower to the ground, you see, and that makes them look a little wobbly when they walk. If you're talking about the wobbliness or the bobbing of their head as they walk, that's something that all birds do and many antelope do as well. And that's because they want to be able to keep the field of view for as long as possible before they move. So as, as an animal moves, as we move, what we see around us changes, but our brain has accounted for that. As we move, we expect the change, so it doesn't feel like a jarring change. But some animals haven't adapted well to this, and instead, they've adapted to moving, they're adapted to move their heads in a way that allows them to keep a particular frame for longest. So it's not actually their heads that are bobbing, but it's their body catching up with their heads. It's that their heads are staying still for as long as possible before they swing their body through. And that's what gives them that, that bobbing head look. Even you see when antelopes move, it looks like they're kind of, looks like a camel when they move. For the same reason, they want to keep that field of view for as long as possible before they move on. So busy, these two. Off they go around the corner. And as they move off, I'm going to send you over to Mike on Bushwalk and I'm going to make my way towards Buffalsook Dam. We walked quite far uh, north of where we were at the, at the southern boundary, and we've come to the drainage line of Indlovu Dam, the dam near our eco training camp. And we found this really interesting little sheltered, uh, you know, little, little nook here. And uh, what's really interesting about this is, as normal, I mean, in these sheltered environments, the lowest part of a drainage line, there's going to be water, as you can see here. But what's most interesting about this is that this water has been dug up by hyenas. There's um, very clear claw marks that you can see all over here. Even over here is a very good claw mark there um, and over there. And here's a track of a hyena right here in front of me. There's two very deep, beautiful tracks here. So this hyena came down from somewhere behind me and walked down to this water, dug away at some of this clay-like mud to expose this water and then have a drink. And then might even, if we see hyenas, especially if they're pregnant or they've eaten a lot and their bellies are really hot and uncomfortable, they'll even roll around and lay in this kind of wet, muddy environment to try and cool down. And it looks like um, it then walked up there. You see all the mud is sprayed all over here from where it was trying to dig to expose uh, this water. So it's not just elephants that will dig for, for water. I've seen uh, lions doing it. I have now can see a hyena has been doing it. You know, baboons can do it as well and monkeys. Um, so it's really amazing to see that animals are utilizing this. And this exposed water, um, it's in a really sheltered environment. So I suspect that we'll probably have water in this for a good few weeks at least, especially with this clay mud creating a barrier that the water can't escape from. So underneath there will be uh, a lot of moisture. And there have been other animals that have used this area as well, not just the hyena, but if you, if you look over here, you can see tracks of some birds. These look like maybe something like thick knees or maybe courses uh, that were walking here. We've got tracks of frogs, as you can see just here. This is frog tracks. So there's a frog hopping here. And even if we look uh, just over there, there is the track of what looks like a genet. A little genet was maybe uh, walking up along this stick here to, to move away from the water after it had a bit of a drink. 
It's a really, really cool environment. And if you look just underneath there, you can see there's lots of uh, grass growing over the edge and underneath they'll be very moist. It's the kind of place where a lot of frogs will maybe bury themselves in the, in the sand to try and stay moist over the, the long winter. Really awesome to see this little place. I was actually wondering what other animals might have come down. I think maybe some zebras have come to drink here because there's a track just behind me which has a very nice, sharp, smooth edge there. And that's the kind of thing that a zebra's hoof will create as it walks away from coming to have a drink. So a really busy little area. Now we're going to continue walking along this drainage line just for a little while to see if we can come and find more little treasure, treasure chests like this full of interesting bush information. You can even see mud on these plants here from animals that finished drinking or mud wallowing. And I've walked up here, scratched along this branch. Even as I sit here, actually, it feels very, very cool. This sand will stay cool for a long time. This is exactly what a hyena would be doing. If it was feeling uncomfortable, maybe the hot part of the day, it'll come lie here in the shade, some of these trees, and stay nice and cool. I love it. I love how they spread this mud all the way up here. It was really vigorously digging. And this is still wet, so that means this is very fresh. This was done last night or maybe early this morning. So when we leave here, we'll come back and check how it's doing. But we'll send you over to Steve, who's at a waterhole right now. Welcome to Bivelsuk. Damn everybody, where it seems like Shishala has just tracked us down and found us. There's a wonderful morning here at the watering hole and so far it's been very, very quiet. We have been moving about, found some old leopard tracks from probably the night before. But it's nice to familiarize ourselves with areas not yet traveled put my own vehicle tracks down on the ground and then start to figure out who's come and gone. Takes a couple days, but we'll get there. Patricia had the same idea as we did to come up to Bufasuk. Oh, she's just quickly skirted off. So this watering hole is still very full, which is great. Good news to start becoming a hive of activity. There's still a few pans around that have still got water in, but they are quickly drying up. But these big water bodies will sustain the area long into winter and into the next rainy season. Remember, water is the currency of life and all the animals we look for birds, the animals all rely on water. going to spend another moment or two here in reflection at Bifusuk watching all while we send you to Dean who's found a beautiful spot himself. Good morning everyone and welcome to and Beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. We were to the north this morning. My name is Dean, and behind the camera we've got Johan. And what a spot it is. We actually decided to come up north to try and find one of the cheetahs with five cubs. She's gone into one of the thick areas here. But during our search, we decided to have a bit of a stop here at this flay or watering hole.
Anna Marie saying it's a very peaceful scene. Yeah, you're hundred percent right, Anna Marie. Anna Marie, it's it's a a lovely spot, a lovely setting. You know, all the birds in the background. There's a couple of white-faced whistling ducks. Just a moment ago, there was a troop of baboons running through the area. It's also lovely to see the contrast. There's a oh, there's a, one of the white-faced whistling ducks hiding in the grass. There are actually two there, um, but for the moment we can only see the one. And a little bit further away, we did see some chicks. Catherine's asking, do these ducks, these white-faced whistling ducks, m mate for life? Yeah, they do indeed. They are um, monogamous. So they're mate for life. Um, I always find it almost romantic when you find birds and animals that are monogamous and mate for life. Same as Egyptian geese, for example. You can also hear the purple crested taraka calling in the distance. Quite a contrast between the the grass, green grass here, and the browner grass in the bush. Felt there goes some warthogs. They did come for a drink only a moment ago, and they've moved off now. Jackson's asking, what are the flowers in the water called? So there's a couple of lilies. I, a bit difficult to tell from here. I see a, a type of crinum lily. That's the main one I can see. And it's quite, quite amazing to see with the cloud cover. Not all of them have actually opened up. But now with the sun, you can see the sun starting to come out now. And then you'll notice they'll all start opening up. All these crinum nitties. You'll notice also the grass moving and the ripples. Seems yesterday, still quite a breeze. Cutting across the reserve. A little bit cooler this morning. I think it's going to warm up nicely with that sun coming out. It's amazing. Oh, a bit of water in the bush attracts so much life, especially in the dry seasons. And 
this little fly and a little watering hole. Only being temporary. Probably start to dry out in the next couple of months, maybe two, three months. And it'll dry out. scene is, yeah, it is definitely very tranquil. As I always say, it's good for the soul. It's so nice just to come to areas like this and just sit and relax and listen to all the sounds. I think for now, though, we're going to try and see if we can find the that cheetah and her five cubs. In the meantime, you're going to head over to Twilu. So we're back at Twilu, and a quarry busted seems to be my nemesis to get them on. There were... There is two, I think, let me just go back for you BK, it's behind this grey camel thorn. It's on the horizon, a little bit further to the right of where the other one came from. So we've had one that went over the mountain, or over the top of the dune, uh, and then there is another one. We're just waiting for it to come onto screen. They're, uh, it's quite far away, but we can see them. Luckily, they're taller than the grass at this point in that particular area. Mirror. Can you see it there? Back a little bit, or? Oh, it's about to join the other one going up and over. Oh. It's official. The Cory Bastard is my nemesis. Every time we've tried, they move out the picture. Gone. Oh, no. The only other bird, oh, I can hear a bird calling quite a bit at the moment. Clap a lock. He's taking off from the branches and then he claps his wings together on his way up and he just claps them all the way and then as he comes uh, down for landing, we'll see if we can get one doing that uh, live. They're quite vocal at the moment. But otherwise it's a relatively quiet morning. At least the sun's up now. It's definitely... Uh, getting warmer for us. John is asking what's the most common antelope on Swalu. So the most numerous is a uh, book. Uh, there's uh, a couple of thousand of those. And then we do also have uh, quite a few springbuck. Eland, but the most common one is definitely the Gimsbok. When you say they're so common, you can't find one anyway. Up and over the next top of the dune, and we'll see uh, what's on the other side. is asking 
asking what time does the sun rise in winter? So at the moment uh, it is eight minutes past seven uh, that it rises. Man, big hole in the road. Some very ambitious digger there. And our sun sets just before uh, six o'clock, probably about quarter to six at the moment. BK is uh, suggesting he'd like to do a, a pan, forward of it. Sorry, BK. <laughs> you say stop. B BK sees a, a beautiful landscape that he wants to show you, but I parked him right in front of a tree. So, not yet, not yet. Maybe after that clump of trees, then we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there, then BK can show you the landscape. Pretty much the Karunaberg mountain range. Almost. Almost. <laughs> I, got, I got a thumbs up. I got a thumbs up from BK. It means I can stop. And then he can show you just pan the landscape. Readjust the angle. <laughs> So these areas down south, uh, quite a lot of grey camel thorn. The different, uh, and that's a normal camel thorn that's going past the screen now. The grey blue ones in the background are the grey camel thorns. And that's the Karunaberg mountain range that you're seeing now. I have to duck my head so this BK can go over the top of my head. We're always so lucky with all these beautiful views. We have received our second batch of name plaques which is super exciting and Marcel is busy mounting them as we speak. For those of you that don't know we are offering the opportunity for wild earth explorers to get their names engraved on a plaque like this. Once your name is on the plaque it will then be attached onto the vehicle. Marcel what are you up to? I'm busy mounting plaques on Trusty Rusty. This means that even though you're at home watching this, it'll still feel as though you're on the vehicle with us as we bumble about the bush. This means that VNA, Prajash, Melanie Greenwood, Linda J. Poli, and Stephen Humbert will be riding along with us as we bumble through the bush, even though you're watching it from home. Now that the name plaques are on the back of the vehicle, it's time for us to head out and go and see what we can find. For many years, Wild Earth has taken viewers from around the world to the Mara Triangle, a place of majestic beauty and abundant wildlife. But it wasn't always like this. Before 2001, it was infested with poachers. Illegal harvesting and hunting was rife. Now the situation couldn't be more different. The hard work and dedication of the Mara Conservancy has revolutionized this magical land. But now, the loss of revenue from tourism has created a grave crisis. The Mara Conservancy needs help if they are to continue protecting the reserve and supporting the local communities whose livelihood depend on its survival.
My name is Steve and one of my favorite things at Wild Earth is getting questions from you. The type of questions that I really like are those ones that really help us to unpack and understand and really integrate the ecological knowledge and fully appreciate the importance that animals such as these Cape Buffalo bring to the ecosystem. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, you're going to have to register on the website. But once registered, just head on over to the live safari page and enter your question under the live feed. Welcome back to and beyond in Gala, everyone. So we have found ourselves this beautiful breeding head of impalas that you can see in front of us there, looking in all different directions. So if you can look at them, they, they don't really have any big males on their attendance there. However, there are some smaller males that I did see with this head. And you see how close together they are like that. So it has started being windy here at Ngala. So of course, for these impalas, they are senses all three of them are sharp like that but if it's windy like this and then i i would say their sense of hearing it's sort of compromised because even these trees will make noises so they have come out in that open and then facing all different directions because now they will depend more on their sight as well as smelling so they do feel a bit vulnerable when it's this kind of weather conditions of course there are a few ox peckers also on the attendance of these impalas so there is one small one standing close to us here there is one red-billed ox pecker right on its forehead. That one. How cool is that? Because that ox pecker doesn't look like it's actually feeding anything. If anything, it looks like it's printing this impala. What a beautiful relationship there. And now you see thing. <laughs> in the air of that impala which is very uncomfortable for that impala as you can see but yeah these birds will accompany these animals as well trying to feed on the ticks which is mutually beneficial for both species but sometimes yeah these birds will make these impalas uncomfortable like that trying to pick on the eyes or even the ears sometimes on the nostrils which for these impalas would be uncomfortable. So this time of the year when these impalas are rutting, so when the males face off with one another like that and one happens to win a territory, so they'll be hoping that a head like this walks into their territory. And then when that happens, then they, that male will try his utmost best to head this this head in his territory for the longest time that they will be able to mate with his females and then pass on his genes like that as you can see they look like most of them are showing some cut because as you can see they're not really really feeding but you can see them time and again that they will be showing ruminating as it is affectionately known You see some members skin twitching time and again. So KG would like to know if these impalas would have a leader that they follow. Yeah, if it is a breeding head like this KG, I think definitely there will be some rank or hierarchy amongst these older females here. So I'm sure that Yes, all the females will be the one that decides what to be or what to do next, where they headed to. So yeah, I think that that they will definitely have one of these big ones. So even all of them that can decide where to go next, and then all these youngsters will just have to follow. 
but yeah that being said look at how they are standing like i've mentioned earlier that they are looking in all different directions so they will be looking out for predators much as i said that they won't be able to hear them necessarily now because it is windy so it is a bit noisy and then we just see them time and again they will be calling their ears like that then cupping them in one direction trying to pick up all the sounds and then see if maybe there are some sounds of predators that might be lurking around beautiful animal simple as say Yeah, like almost all of them are standing. There is one, however, at the back that looks like she's just sitting down. So, Patricia would like to know if it's just the males that have got horns. Yes, Patricia, with this impala say it will only be the males that has got horns. So, amongst this head in front of us here, there is, so there are... There is one at least that I can see that their horns are starting to grow too, actually. So those horns with age, they'll grow with age. That's when they'll take the turns and curls like that. So as you can see that one, their horns are just coming out like that. So it's only the females that will have horns, that is true. Of course, they will need that for fighting or when they do display a standoff against one another but these females since they don't really fight amongst themselves if you do think about it they don't really need those horns isn't this just beautiful hey that white under the belly and also on its muzzle beautiful different colors in these animals and of course you see those markings on the back so it looks like three dark lines and you can also see that on the tip of their ears especially at the back here so if these impalas have got lambs and then they are moving maybe in the thick or tall grasses so that's what these lambs will be looking at to try and follow these adult animals so a few of them are looking straight at us So for now, we are just going to leave this impalas and make our way towards that area where that lioness and the small two cubs are found. In the meantime, we'll send you over to Deidre in Tualo, see what antelopes she's got for us. So we have the second largest antelope. At this distance, he doesn't look very large, but that is a beautiful roan, a nice male roan. And uh, similar facial markings to a chemsbok, uh, and even a sable, except uh, the rest of them very long ears. You can even see that from this distance. And sort of a, a, a dusty, sort of a dirty brown color. So really pretty. He is quite far. He's right on the top of the dune crest uh, in the distance. And he's just uh, also just busy eating his breakfast. Probably enjoying the sun up there too. BK, I can hear a little pygmy falcon. Let's see. I think he's just on the top of that shepherd's tree. On the right hand side of the... Th Don't tell me he just flew off. He did literally just fly off. <coughs> oh no. There was a pygmy falcon.
We're gonna send you now to Trishana, who's got something cool. Cool indeed, it's two rough plated lizards that are sunning themselves in this termite mound. They are so, so cool. So still like their statues. Trying to absorb as much sun as possible to warm up for the day's activities, which will include foraging. They are omnivorous, so they like fruits, flowers, um, even insects, millipedes. They'll go about their day. Much like our little carnivorous friends, the dwarf mongoose, they are diurnal, they need to start their day by being small bodied by collecting as much sun as possible. Ooh. must be bothering its face there. I'm sure that these mounds, so these termite mounds that we find many animals using as homes are not always completely disused by termites. There might be portions of it that are uh, sealed off and no longer used in many animals like um, these lizards, um, black lined lizards as well. They'll use these parts of the mounds. Even when we talk about hyenas and warthogs using the mounds, they could still be plenty of termites in it, just not in that specific part of the mound or that specific um, vent. So perhaps a little termite managed yeah, to get. Maybe just a little termite got into its face. Now, like most reptiles, they are lacking uh, a pinnae or a portion of their ear that's outside, but you can see very clearly that they have ear holes there behind the eyes, and that allows them to still hear. Many reptiles um, hear at limited frequencies, some at lower frequencies than we can, our range of hearing is between about 20 to 20,000 hertz. But reptiles have a, a slightly more limited range when it comes to hearing. And at the lower end of it. So us up to 20,000, so you think of things like um, tortoises or, yeah, tortoises are about two, about one and a half thousand hertz. So much lower frequencies and most reptiles hear at those frequencies and that would be because it's most um, most useful for them. Reptiles also have a difficult time telling uh, or distinguishing loudness. How loud something is which is different, see, different to the frequency of, of a sound. Hi, Jeanette, you'd like to know if they eat the termites in that mound. It's unlikely that they will be eating them currently because like I said to you, they, um, they're probably using a section that is not used by the termites currently if there are any termites in it because it could be that it's completely disused. It could be that there is a portion of it that is sealed off that is no longer used by the termites. So it's, they could be coexisting and they could not be. But also termites are are quite small so they might take a few of them as they go about but they don't specifically forage for termites that changes when the termites produce allates allates are the winged reproductive cast of the termite um, 
group. And those are nice and juicy. And when that happens, you'll find any animal, almost every animal that is not strictly herbivorous will enjoy an allate or two, including these guys. They'll often stand or, or sit at, mal at entrances like this little fence as the allates come streaming through and they'll catch them. And you can find all kinds of of animals at a termite mound when that's happening. You might find lepers trying to eat allates, um, frogs, scorpions, plenty of lizards, geckos, all trying to get in on the allate action. And the thing is when you have those animals around, concentrated on a, in a specific place, like around a termite mound, small animals, maybe even some small mammals around, then you might get bigger snakes come to feed on the animals that are, the smaller animals that are around the mound feeding on the allates. Then you might find that you have large animals that will come feed on those animals. So it's a very interesting time when the allates come through. The allates will usually fly at the beginning to mid of the wet season. It's nice and hot and wet out in the bush. Hi Tabo, you'd like to know how big these lizards will grow. They're not actually terribly large. They're probably about, um, these are adults. And they're, the biggest for an adult is around 20 centimeters, probably the average, between 15 and 20 centimeters is the average length. You will find specimens that are larger or smaller, but 20 centimeters is, is about it. They've got that nice, thick, juicy tail. And I remember Darcy Ann asked a question the last time we had one of the plated lizards. I think it was one of the plated lizards, or was it the black-lined lizard? Um, but we were talking about their tails and how fat their tails are. And they literally are, there's lots of fat storage in the tails and they can lose their tails. In fact, that's what we were discussing, whether they could or they couldn't, because some books outright stated it and some didn't. So it had made me consider that maybe they don't, but in fact they do. And there are few lizards that don't drop their tails. Most actually do. They'll do that to try and escape predators, but what they'll also do to escape predators is to go into a crevice. So you'll find them ar around rocky areas quite a lot. So termite mounds are kind of a rocky area. It could be a, it could mimic a rocky area because there's a nice spot for them to hurry into and escape from predators. But you'll find them up at in Torchwood near first rock, second rock. There's a lot of them around because they need that environment to help them escape predators. And what they'll do is they'll go into and squeeze into a small space and then inflate their bodies. So that nothing can pull them out. They've, their skin is against the walls of whatever crevice they've crept into. But if that doesn't work and they have no small space to creep into, they'll drop their tail in an attempt to lose their predator. I'm not sure if this is a, a couple that we've got. It could be. Sometimes they share um, these mounds together. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you'll find them on their own. And the sexes are, are quite difficult to tell apart. 
The only difference would be that in the breeding season, the males have a slightly pinkish hue to their throat. As you can see, it's difficult to tell whether either of these have it. And if they do, it would be quite obvious. But like I said, that's just during the breeding season. And they are most likely to mate kind of in August. So there's still some time to go before they start breeding. And then they'll lay their eggs at a time when, when a time when resources are, are really abundant. So October, November. And then they'll, those eggs will be incubated for about two and a half months or so. Before little ones emerge. Now they don't, they don't a leg, they don't leg, they don't lay a lot of eggs at a time. Just a few, about two to six eggs. They're quite big as well. I found some of them before. They're quite much bigger than um, than gecko eggs. Gecko eggs are quite tiny. These ones are quite large. Pam, you say they're beautiful. They are. They're really good-looking lizards. They have a very, very shiny and very neat. But I find that about lizards in general, scaled ones at least. They are very, very neat. You can see there's an ant kind of moving around there. Maybe it was a termite. Sometimes animals can have such opportunistic behavior. But sometimes they can be very focused on what it is that they need. Like now these, these two are very focused on the fact that they want to sun themselves regardless of the fact that a couple insects walk past. While other times they can be such opportunists and completely be looking at something else but something comes past and they grab it. I got a question there that was honey glue, honey dew. You wanted to know how long it takes for them to regrow their tail. Bunny blue, I think that's it. <laughs> I'm sorry if I've got it incorrectly. Um, the tail, so what happens, I don't know exactly how long it takes the species to regrow its tail, but regrowth of, ta of the tail is, an, is a quite an interesting thing. So the tail is an extension of the spine and the spine is bony. But there's a certain part of a certain node where the boniness of the spine stops and then what is what continues um, is is cartilage after after it drops off. So that makes it easier. So it's originally bone the whole way. And then at that little node, it's like an abscission area. It can easily drop off its tail without causing damage to its blood vessels and things like that. So it doesn't bleed out. So when that tail grows back, it doesn't grow bone back. What it does is it grows cartilage back in place of that bone. And that's because b b growing bone is is very costly and if you can regrow an entire tail it's very very costly now i've been watching a skink i think it looked like a little skink um that was around our rooms that recently dropped its tail and i could see that it was actually quite red that skink still lives around the room and now it's got this stub that is still not fully grown. In fact, it's it's maybe a centimeter and a half, and it's at least been four weeks, if that gives you some idea at least. Anyway, this was awesome. I'm going to send you over to Swalu and see what they're up to, and we're going to move on.
two beautiful little birds. One beautiful little bird. <laughs> the uh, ant eating chats. So they're just busy feeding. It looks like somebody's scratched open a uh, hole overnight. They're just busy feeding here, or it could even be a hole that they actually live in. These are one of the few species of birds that'll actually live underground, uh, and they'll live in the roof of an art park burrow. Yeah, that must be their hole, just down here. I don't know, BK, can you see? Over my head. <laughs> I'll duck. Oh, there, they're just going into the hole. But, um, so they do live in underground holes. Uh, and in winter season, they are key to finding pangolin and artfark because they follow them. After they've been feeding, then they tend to leave a trail of ants or termites behind, which uh, the anteating chat says, thanks very much, I'll have a few of those. And they live in little family uh, family groups. Very cooperative. He's only about three meters away, sitting on the bush, quite close to us. Jessica is asking the question, do they actually eat ants? Yes. Insects in general, but ants being uh, top of their list, as well as uh, termites. Ants, termites, and other insects. There we go, you've just seen a live kill. That was probably an ant. So that flicking of the wings is a characteristic of the chats. When uh, they stationary for a second, they just flick their wings quickly and then close them. And the ant-eating chats are beautiful little white windows on their wings, but only when they fly can you see those. Very sort of upright stance at a distance. Ooh. There's a bird that's very vocal on the left hand side. You probably hear him, is getting all the ant eating chats coming in. It's most likely a bird shouting at a mongoose. Uh, normally, when they shout at a mongoose, everybody goes up to the trees and they go and have a look because uh, they'll feel threatened by that. I can't see anything, the grass is too thick. But the birds are telling us there's something there. Gary is asking the question, are there any birds that are herbivores? Uh, I, can just, I can think of sort of ducks and geese. Uh, they eat plant material, but they're not exclusively herbivores. They're probably more omnivores because they'll also eat snails and crabs and other things. Uh, ostrich eat plant material, quarry busters eat plant material, but they're always substituting it with other things. So I don't think that there's actually a bird that I can think of that's exclusively a, her a herbivore. Uh, off the top of my head, that's a good question. So the ant-eating chats would be classified as insectivores because their predominant diet is insects. A frugivore if you're a fruit eater, like one of the terracos. Uh, Piscivore if you're a fish eater, like a kingfisher. And you even get a grainivore, the ones that'll eat uh, grains and grass seeds. Are 
Are there birds that milk their young is what I heard is the question. I'm not 100% sure. FC, maybe you can repeat that. Not that I know of. Birds basically, as soon as the, as soon as the chick is hatched, then they will go and fetch food and bring it back and feed the chicks that way. He's got to balance carefully there. He's sitting on a blackthorn. All those little knobs that you see are actually thorns so he does have to be careful with exactly where he puts his feet but you can see now we were talking about birds perching on thin little branches you can actually see how this anteating chat is holding on uh, and its feet are closed so the back the back foot almost makes a closed circle uh, and that's how they manage to balance really well and then there's normally sort of like a ligament and a tendon that if they bend their leg in a certain direction it almost locks into place so they can uh, comfortably sleep at night on a branch and know that they're almost locked in and won't fall off while they're sleeping. Susan's comment is uh, she wishes she could uh, sleep like that. We can just move on and see uh, if there are any other birds about. asking the question why don't we have as many impalas on the reserve as all the others so this is not this is a sort of a natural overlap between an impala and a springbuck range but because of the more arid environments it's a more suited environment for the springbuck especially out in the dunes the impalas here tend to focus a lot of the activity at the base of the mountains where the habitat is ideal for them so we do have them but we've got very few of them relative to springbuck but it is more of an area where springbuck are more comfortable. Uh, what you're looking at there is a steenbuck, a nice female. We also very randomly able to get them on air because they dash off quickly. She's standing dead still because she doesn't think we've seen her yet. If we approach her closer, she's going to dash off. And sometimes, yeah, there we go. She <laughs> sometimes they just lie down completely as if uh, they're going to hide. But she was grooming there, which means she thinks her camouflage is working for her there. Or she's just relaxed with our presence now. We know a threat. We've stopped. So we're not uh, approaching her. And she feels like we're at a safe enough distance that if she does need to flee, she's got more than enough time. Beautiful little faces. Very big ears. They must really be struggling at the moment to even see over the grass. <laughs> Keep 
nuclear from raptors. Uh, I think Jacqueline asked the question, how do they keep clear from raptors? So Stembok are very fast, uh, and they do have, they always have sort of bushes that they can hide under. The only raptor that's large enough to potentially grab a Stembok would be a martial eagle. Uh, so here, not commonly occurring. We do see them every now and then, but they're not commonly occurring, so the Stembok can probably rest easy. It probably has to worry more about predators like jackal, wild dog, and cheetah than uh, aerial predators. Nice to see her just go through her normal morning routine. <laughs> yes, we are still here. <laughs> now you see her, now you don't. disappeared behind the bushes. Glad we got a glimpse of her. If you love to watch Wild Earth, then we are inviting you to join our Explorers program. For a monthly subscription, you will have the opportunity to win fantastic Wild Earth expeditions, join our guides for a chat around the fire, receive weekly highlights from our shows, and much more. All the money will go to keeping these live safaris on air, which in turn allows us to escape into nature every single day. The reason why we see that wildebeest by himself is because he's a male, or a bull, as we typically would call him. And what he does is that he marks and defends an area Essentially, he is looking for the ultimate piece of land or prime property. He needs to have good grazing, needs to have a water source close by. And not too far away from here, there's a sickle bush thicket that would provide just enough shelter from the wind and the rain. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Fisher and I'm going to be your guide this afternoon. I'm looking really forward to taking you through and showing you all the beautiful places here at Anbion and Gala. If you have any questions, please register on our website. Once registered, go to the live page feed and post your questions underneath the live feed. Join me on my next safari through Anbion and Gala on Wild Earth. Send me live questions through the Wild Earth website and I'll answer them live from the African bush. Look at this, the little one is up and about. Certainly hasn't had enough milk at this age. No amount of milk is enough. Oh, corky. Too sweet. Oh, look at this. <laughs> that is stunning. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Hello everyone, my name is Trishala and I am a naturalist and safari guide here in Juma Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands in South Africa. I think that the information that we provide and most importantly the questions that you ask give both you and I a really good idea of what's going on. My friend Fernando here, he's a flat neck chameleon and I love them. They're just these gems that you manage to find in the bush. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. Just in time to watch quite a big troop of baboons moving away. I love watching baboons. There was maybe about 20, 30 baboons in there and I, can th I think I can still hear more. So many of their behaviors look way too familiar. 
um, and I kind of like that discomfort. But we've got an array of of animals here. This end when here, Philemon's dip. Got some wildebeest and impala also around with these baboons. Oh, I love it when they stand up like that. There's a massive, massive male in this group. Obviously, the alpha, the alpha male. He's been um, leading the group as well as terrorizing anybody in his wake. It's not this guy though. The alpha male is in front. really, really quite a large male. Now, males are usually about 30 kgs or so, so you don't think of them as particularly huge animals, but a big male can be about 40 kgs. Females about half that size, about 15 kg kgs on average. Yeah, as our wildebeest, everyone seems to be following the same path. I love seeing animals interact like this. The wildebeest have been watching the baboons, but not um, not chasing them, anything like that. But each time they run past, you see the wildebeest always have their head down, eating. But their eye structure allows them to still see the horizon as they have their heads down, similarly to horses. So when the baboons run past, they get their attention for that brief moment and then they pick up a head and watch the baboon cross and then their heads back down, eating. I love watching that. Um, the last time we had that really amazing baboon sighting on quarantine, the one where the one was getting chased by the alpha male, um, there was a wildebeest that was on his own that kept kind of following them, which was interesting as well. Those kind of things, you don't get to, to read about them in books because it's anecdotal, you know, people watching these things happen. That's why I think what we do out here is so special. We get to not just have these experiences and spend so much time watching animals and waiting for these things, but we get to share it with you. And we get to catch it on film. So we have evidence. Very important. Well, that is definitely one of my favorite things about being out here. These experiences with animals, between animals, and being able to share it with you. That's a baboon shouting there. Well, there we go, guys. It's that time of the day where we say goodbye and especially thank you for your questions and your comments. We'll see you this afternoon for Sunset Safari. Bye for now. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, safari lovers. What a wonderful glimpse.